This is Dr. Ben White with the Rational Wellness Podcast, bringing you the cutting edge information on health and nutrition from the latest scientific research and by interviewing the top experts in the field. Please subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast on iTunes and YouTube and sign up for my free ebook on my website by going to drwhites.com. Let's get started on your road to better health. Hey, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Thank you for, so much for joining me again today for another episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a review on iTunes. That helps more people find out about it. And today, we're going to interview Dr. Kenneth Brown, a functional gastroenterologist and the developer of Antron Till, an herbal product used to treat methane-producing um, uh, methane producing small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And this is a very interesting product. We're using it in our, in our office very successfully. Uh, Dr. Brown has um, done several studies um, showing it to be 80% effective in relieving SIBO symptoms such as bloating, constipation, and in abdominal discomfort. And he's also in the process of completing a multi-center trial and we love that kind of scientific approach. So, Dr. Brown, thank you so much for joining me today. No, thank you so much, Dr. Weitz, and I appreciate you having me on. It's an honor to be on the Rational Wellness Podcast. <laughs> so, um, since we're going to be talking about SIBO, what do you think are some of the most common causes of SIBO? So, when we talk about SIBO, and I'm sure most of your listeners... I guess we should probably define what it is to begin with, yeah. Yeah, so when you say SIBO, it's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And what that means is whenever, what people don't quite realize is, is that your microbiome, we're always talking about the microbiome or the bacteria that live within us, they really should exist primarily in your colon. And that's where you have a uh, hundred trillion bacteria, a thousand different species, and they coexist with us. I mean, it's an argument, do we exist for them or do they exist for us? But when we treat them right, they can be very beneficial for us. Now, so it isn't so much that bacteria are good or bad, it's just that bacteria can start to grow where they shouldn't be. So in the upper intestine, specifically the duodenum, what can happen is that bacteria can start to grow there. That can be due to severe stress, an infection, taking antibiotics, or a very poor diet will allow the bacteria to start to grow. And when that happens, you have bacteria growing where it shouldn't be. So when you eat, the bacteria will break down the food before you can, creating bloating, discomfort, change in bowel habits, and all these other symptoms like that. That's really what bacterial overgrowth is. Bacteria growing where it shouldn't be. And basically, this is the believed to be the main cause of irritable bowel syndrome. Exactly. So I was doing research. So my background as a gastroenterologist, I um, have been doing clinical research, pharmaceutical research specifically for the last 15 years. And when I was working with one of your prior guests, Dr. Pimentel, uh, he came up with this whole model. He had a mouse model that demonstrated that you can actually have bacteria growing where it shouldn't be, and then you can develop these symptoms. So he was the first guy to really demonstrate that, hey, this is very similar to that paradigm shift that took place over 35 years ago when we used to think that ulcers were actually caused by stress and anxiety. And then an Australian gastroenterologist figured out that it was caused by Helicobacter pylori or H. pylori. So a, a similar paradigm shift. So all these people that we've been patting on the head saying, oh, you have IBS, take this antidepressant. Oh, you're just stressed. Don't worry about it. And these people would come back and go, well, if it's just IBS, why am I so miserable? That's all these people will now realize probably have a bacterial component to it. And if you have a bacteria that produce a certain type of gas, like methane, it'll cause constipation. If you have bacteria that produce uh, hydrogen sulfide, it'll cause diarrhea. One of the problems I've always had as a gastroenterologist is the fact that you, can, you have this unifying diagnosis called IBS, but you've got opposing symptoms. That's always bothered me. Either you have back pain or you don't. So when you have somebody that has diarrhea and then the opposing symptom constipation and we call it the same thing, that's not right. And now we have a unifying diagnosis and the SIBO kind of explains all of it. And, and it's kind of interesting that the antidepressants may have actually had some benefit 
but not because it improved their depression or their psychological outlook, because there are serotonin receptors in the small intestine and decreased motility uh, may be a factor in, in the cause of uh, small intestinal overgrowth. And so it may be that the uh, antidepressant stimulated the serotonin receptors in the small intestine. So some of those patients may have actually gotten benefit uh, for their small bacterial overgrowth that they didn't know they had. Exactly. So, you know, what people don't realize is you have more serotonin receptors in your gut than you do in your brain. Yeah. Which is why as a gastroenterologist dealing with these functional medicine problems, I call it the, you know, sort of the gut brain connection. That's what's going on. I treat the brain as much as I treat the gut and vice versa, because the two interact with each other. And you know, as a functional doctor that you don't just treat the end organ, you have to treat the whole body. And definitely the brain is almost always involved in everything. Right. So uh, what do you think, we, what are some of the causes of this small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? I know Dr. Pimentel feels that a percentage of these are, result from a case of food poisoning that leads to damage to the uh, migrating motor complex due to toxins released by the uh, bacteria that causes food poisoning that damages the, the nerves that control the um, motility of the small intestine. Exactly. So he was smart enough to actually realize that we were calling people post-infectious IBS. We're actually, some people will develop inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, and they're called post-infectious. What he realized is, is that when you get exposed to a certain bacteria, Salmonella, Shigella, or these very common ones, then your body can overreact, produce antibodies to get rid of it, which is important. But then these antibodies hang around and they misinterpret these cells of Kajal, which are these um, electrical poles. Think of it that way. So you've got a current that goes through and in your intestines, there's a migrating motor complex, meaning an electrical impulse starts and makes your intestines move from the stomach all the way to the cecum, which is how we move our food through. Well, antibodies can be produced called vinculin antibodies, and they can actually bind to those things and actually shut them off. So think of them like cell towers being turned off. And that happens in about 20% of the people that actually have an infection like that. So 20% of our SIBO people, we look for that, and you can actually get, he actually developed a very eloquent test called the IBS check, where you can see if somebody has these antibodies. What that tells us is you're going to be at risk for having recurrent issues. And that's something that um, I discuss with my patients. Go, look, why, why every few months I'll get treated, I'll feel better. Five months later, I have this. I'm like, okay, look, it looks like you have essentially developed an autoimmune disease to the motility of your intestines. So that's one cause. That's how the infections cause it. The infections also cause it by having your body overreact to it and have it you don't have to form the antibodies but it changes the whole bacterial motility for a little bit and what you would normally have is a free-flowing stream crystal clear it shocks it and then bacteria start to grow and the bacteria themselves can produce gases to slow it down so now we end up going from a small little stream to a bigger sewer and then the bacteria start growing and then the other uh, couple reasons that actually can happen is taking antibiotics will do it People don't realize the destructive nature of these antibiotics. I try to only use them when it's completely necessary. And there's a lot of researchers out there showing that we really disrupt a lot of things by giving so much antibiotics. And then ultimately- And, and by the way, with antibiotics go anything that would kill the bacteria. So that also includes pesticides that are found in our food and insecticides that use around the house, et cetera, et cetera. I love that you brought that up because that was the other thing. People don't realize that when they're eating a lot of refined foods, it has all that glyphosate in it. Glyphosate is Roundup, which is an antibiotic, and it can do the exact same thing. If we eat a lot of meats that are you know, with that. I think you probably saw that recent study where if you work with household cleaners, it's just as dangerous as smoking for 20 years. Yeah. So unfortunately, you know, uh, people in the industrial cleaning industry are exposing themselves to a lot of toxins, and it does very, very similar things. So. So the bottom line is what I tell people. And then the final thing is that gets missed a whole lot is anytime you go through a very stressful situation, you can actually go through this fight or flight 
process. And then that, when you go through a sympathetic response or fight or flight, it actually slows down your intestines. I like to tell my patients, I get so many people that are like, it's like having insult to injury. Somebody will go through the death of a family or they'll go through a bad divorce and then they'll show up at my office and I have to explain to them that, look, that was very traumatically stressful for you. Your body was in a constant state of fight or flight. It's going to reserve its energy so that you can get out of the situation. You know, if you're being, it's, you know, from paleo times, when you're being chased by a saber toothed tiger, you don't want to get hungry or stop and have to use the restroom. You want to just get out of the situation. In our society today, that stress just stays so high that that can affect the intestines. So those major things, antibiotics, post-infection, diet, and stress can all do it. What do you think about, uh, a lot of people talk about ileocecal valve problems as playing a role. Is that, how, how often do you think that really happens? Oh, so that is, that's fascinating to me because that's one of those deals where I think more clinically as opposed to what's actually being said. So for instance, I was listening to a podcast by um, JJ Virgin. Okay. She had um, a functional medicine doctor on and he was citing that as one of the causes of bacterial overgrowth. Very clearly it is our ileocecal valve is built to be there. And if, for those that don't know, that's the valve from the end of the small intestine going into the cecum or the first part of the colon. What it does is we have these valves. Its job is to let things into the cecum and prevent the cecum from coming back in. We call that backwash ileitis when you can actually have some inflammation in the ileum. So it makes sense. Oh, if lots of your stool is going back into the small bowel, you can colonize it. Here's the problem I have with it. I deal with a lot of inflammatory bowel disease, which includes a disease called Crohn's. So one of the things in one of the treatments of Crohn's, since 70% will show up in the ileum, is the surgical resection takes out the ileocecal valve in the right colon, and my surgeons will hook up the last part of the uh, intestine, a portion of the ileum, directly to the colon. So there is no more valve. Right. And I don't see SIBO in most of these people. And I've got, I don't know, a couple hundred people that have had this done. Huh. So, um, so yes, I guess it's plausible, but I think we're giving too much credence to it. And I think people want to give a reason as to why they're developing it. I, um, I was talking to, um, Anyways, I'll remember, it was another doctor and we were actually discussing this uh, about this exact same concept. And he said, I think people are trying to wrap their hands around why. Uh, you know, and patients wanna know why. They wanna say, oh, I'm having this because my ileocecal valve is this. I'm having this because, um, and then what we realize is that maybe there's other things going on and it probably comes down to pure motility issues. And um, I was speaking with, I think you know him, Chris Kresser out there in oh, yeah. California. So we were, we were conversing about this because he has a lot of patients that are extremely difficult to deal with um, as far as recurrent issues. And he's realizing that when you take even a more functional medicine approach and look at some of these people and realize that possibly they've got mercury toxicity or different things. And he's got me thinking that, oh, maybe some of these things we need to treat. I can fix the symptoms. It's the person that keeps coming back to me. They're like, man, I was better, and now I'm back to where I was again. And then we keep treating, and I guess right. that's good for business if I've got this company where I'm selling a product. But as a, but as a physician, I want them to get better. Right. And he brought it to my attention that maybe we're missing a certain amount of um, environmental toxins, which are actually affecting the motility, which is causing the bacterial overgrowth. So. If we look at a big picture, I think that the ileocecal valve thing is plausible, but I have so many patients that have had that completely cut out and they don't show up two months later with bacterial overgrowth. Hey, I'd like to go off topic for just a second because you brought up the surgical situation. I've had a number of patients who had their colon removed completely. How are we supposed to think about that? Are they then supposed to have a microbiome? Do they not have a microbiome? I mean, does their colon, does their small intestine become the place for their microbiome? Can you live without a microbiome? I, what does that mean? So when th that's called a total colectomy. Yeah. So when people have a total colectomy, it's usually due to a disease called ulcerative colitis. Right. It can be due to other things, um, but the majority of people that are going to continue to live without a colon is because of ulcerative colitis. What the surgeons will do is they will take the last part of the small bowel. So they cut out your colon, put it in a bucket, 
and it goes away. Now, something to keep in mind is, is that microbiome is so sick due to inflammation that they've been living without a proper functioning microbiome for a long time. So keep that in mind with these people. So the body's already starting to adapt. Then they will take the last few loops of the small intestine and they cut the middle of it and they essentially build what's called an ileoanal pouch or they build a kind of a fake rectum and then they attach it to the anus. That mucosa starts to become like colonic mucosa. And so it actually develops its own microbiome and people can end up with situations like proctitis is what, or I'm sorry, um, we call it, um, um, basically it's the ileum that gets there, it gets essentially inflamed. And so that inflamed area there, uh, we can treat and we have to treat it with typical ways that we would treat. Probiotics will actually help those people. And that's one of the few places where the literature has really shown that it's been very, very effective is in people like this. Oh, pouchitis. I'm sorry. I had a little brain slip there. It's called pouchitis. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it can actually help with pouchitis. And we sometimes use antibiotics for those people, which means that the microbiome is certainly playing a role with that. Uh, so yes, you can certainly live without a colon. People do, and they live very fruitful lives. The body adapts. The body's very resilient to it. I think that we're just scratching the surface about what the microbiome can actually do, but maybe we don't need the whole colon. I mean, because I have all kinds of patients that have sections of it taken out, the whole colon taken out, and they're perfectly healthy for years and years and years, decades, perfectly healthy. Interesting. Um, do you use breath testing for diagnosing small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? And if so, do you use lactulose or glucose or fructose or all of them? So this comes down to the, what is the best test to diagnose bacterial overgrowth, SIBO? So when we start looking at these different tests, um, the one that keeps being referenced in the literature is the very old way of doing it, which is a jejunal aspirate. And the original studies with that, we called that the gold standard. But then we've learned in more recent literature that the jejunal aspirate um, is actually not nearly as sensitive nor specific as we thought. Mm -hmm. The other thing about that is the old way of doing it was dropping a tube down and then aspirating. And we know that there's lots of contamination. There's only a few gastroenterologists in the country. One of them is named Satish Rao. He's out of uh, Augusta, Georgia, and he will do a very dedicated sterile endoscopy. And they don't go to the jejunum. The jejunum is very far into the small bowel. Most of the bacterial overgrowth takes place in the duodenum. So when people are referencing jejunal aspirate studies, that is an archaic method of doing it. So now, if you talk to a guy like Dr. Rao, he'll explain that he goes into the duodenum and aspirates and then tries to selectively keep it totally sterile. And it's a very laborious and hard process. So that being said, that's what we thought was the gold standard. And as time has gone on, we realize it's probably not. So we're left with the next best thing, which is a breath test. And this is where you will have somebody take in some sort of, we call it a substrate or some sort of sugar, and you measure baseline hydrogen and methane. Then you take this in, and if bacteria are growing high up into the small bowel, the thought process is they will break it down and then the gas gets absorbed, and then you will breathe it out. So by definition, that seems like a cool thing, but it's, it's flawed from the very beginning because there's so many ways it can be messed with. Both the type of test it's done, so there's many companies out there. Um, the one that I'm using right now, uh, because I can hand my patient a kit, and he's actually in LA, um, Peyton Berukum, is the gastroenterologist that started this company. It's Pivotal Diagnostics. Okay. This, yeah, this way I can hand them a kit. So I know my patient's leaving with a kit, and I, I say, I expect you to do this. Aero Diagnostics is a pretty good one, but they have to mail them the kit, and I expect that to happen. So there is a rule for breath tests. I don't start with it. And what I do is, if you show up to me and you eat a substrate, in other words, starches, and you bloat, and you develop these symptoms, especially when people come to me and they go, man, I was totally fine five years ago. And then X, Y, or Z happened. I went to India and I got really bad food poisoning and I've never been right since. You're screaming to me those, those causes that can bring on SIBO. So I'm going to treat you like SIBO. If you don't get better or if there's other reasons, 
then I consider doing the breath test. And that's just because the breath test, there was a recent review in 2017 with Dr. Pimentel, Satish Rao, uh, Brooks Cash, sort of the guys in my, my neck of the woods in the non-functional area, you know, the, the research area. And their conclusion was really funny. After all of this, it was, there is distinct heterogeneity amongst the data, so we can't make a conclusion. Basically, it is probably the best thing that we have and really kind of use it judiciously, but don't hang your hat on it. It will not pick up hydrogen sulfide. Um, it, if it is methane, some of the experts like Dr. Pimentel will say, if you are methane positive, it's probably positive. So you can kind of trust that as long as you have a rise in methane. Some people start out high in methane and that's a different situation, but if you get a rise, then maybe that's going on. I use it when people don't get better if they have um, you know, recurrent situations, if they've got atypical symptoms. And I'll tell you where I like to use it. I can look at this and I say, I am 100% sure you have SIBO. They've got classic symptoms. Why are you not getting better? So many times since I get people that have already seen a lot of other doctors, they'll come in with a baseline and they'll say, this is my test, they treated me for this and I didn't get better. I will repeat the test and for me, if somebody's like methane positive, if they are normal and then all of a sudden at like 20 minutes, it spikes and possibly goes down, then possibly what's missing is that the bacteria is living very high up, like the duodenal bulb and the duodenal sweep. And maybe the medications we're giving, including natural products like Altrontil, herbal antibiotics, Zyfaxin, all these other things, it's not even, it's not even dissolved yet. So it's dissolving further down. And then vice versa can happen. I'll see these people with peaks later and go, oh, we're not getting enough concentration to where we need to. So I use breath tests to fine tune what I'm already doing. That's how I use them. By the way, Genova will mail you the kits that you can hand to your patients now too. And they also- I forgot Genova has it also, yeah. 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 Um, so when you treat with Ogtrantil, is that the only thing you'll use? Will you use other herbal products at the same time? Do you- do you also use um, an agent for motility? Do you, do you also put the patient on a special diet as well? All fantastic questions. So Atrantil is basically a combination of three polyphenols that work together. And the way that it works is we use a little bit of the peppermint leaf, not the oil, because I wanted the polyphenol component of it. And that calms the area down. Then the second ingredient, which is the one that I get a lot of questions on. It's called Quebracho. It's Quebracho Colorado. It's a beautiful polyphenol known as a proanthocyanidin, and it's a tannin. It doesn't get absorbed. So we put that one in there because it is a very old ancient tree that has specific uh, defense against an archaeobacter. Now, an archaeobacter is the type of organism that produces the methane. So in the intro, you mentioned methane producing. That's the route that we initially started because that, that was the tough group to treat. So we know that the cabracho can get rid of the methane and then the conquer tree works. It's a saponin and it basically works by getting rid of the bacteria and it shuts the enzyme off in the archaea species. So in our clinical trials, we have two published studies, one randomized, one where we treated people with the worst of the worst. We were able to show that really four out of five people definitely get better. So that being said, because of the type of practice I have, I get the people, I get that fifth person. <laughs> Almost always I get the fifth person that uh, you know, has tried different things. So what I do for my, I listen to what they say. First thing is history says so much. When you eat and 20 minutes later, hour later, you're bloated like that, the timing of when you get bloated tells me what's going on. If you're bloated all the time, I'm really worried that something else is going on. So I get a bunch of people that come in and they said, I saw Dr. So-and-so, they put me on Zyfaxin, I've done some herbal antibiotics, I went to a naturopath, eventually I tried your stuff, I'm still bloated. And I'll talk to them, are you bloated when you wake up? Yeah, so you bloated this, and then you really start looking. So I realized that um, we're, I've been able to find a lot of very interesting things, occult celiac disease, occult Crohn's. I found five or six carcinoid tumors. We've found just uh, things that I normally, when you walk through, you know, I mean, the old adage in medicine training is if you hear, you know, uh, hoof steps, you don't think, 
zebras, you think horses. Well, in this case, I'm getting zebras walking through at this point. Yeah. Um, and then, then that leaves the people that we've ruled everything else out. I've done the full workup. What else do I do? I believe that since the starches are a significant problem, we're feeding the bacteria. I like to put people on, at a minimum, a gluten-free diet. Now, you'll hear a lot of people throw around the FODMAP diet. That's the sort of du jour knee-jerk in my field, at least. And there's elemental diets, SCD diets, GAPS diet. There's all these other diets out there. The one thing that they all have in common is you really take away a lot of the starches, and you certainly take away the gluten. Especially oh. fermentable fibers, right? Exactly, yeah. So that comes down to the fermentable fibers are essentially prebiotics, and bacteria love them. And they're very good for us when you're in a normal state. So when you're in a healthy state, taking those prebiotics or fibers are very good. The polyphenols are a prebiotic. Your bacteria will break them down and generate energy for you. So uh, coming back to an evolutionary type thing, when we couldn't really have access to all the food we needed, you could actually eat a plant-based diet and your bacteria will produce short chain fatty acids that will help feed the tissue around you in colonic mucosa and give you energy. So I like to do at least a gluten-free diet. I'm not a big fan of gluten in general. I myself am gluten-free. So I try to only recommend things that I'm willing to do myself. I have a lot of people that have tried these extreme diets and it's just temporary. When you look at the data, uh, the, it, the most recent data looking at this is that FODMAP diet is about 28% effective in relieving IBS symptoms. Gluten-free diet is 28% effective in relieving IBS symptoms. And these are the IBS population, not necessarily the SIBO population. And there's lots of overlap, and we can talk about the problems with some of the literature with that. But so going gluten-free, then I have Atrantil. I look at this, and if they've got more diarrhea predominant, I do have some success by adding something else. I do have some success by possibly using Zyfaxin. I have used other herbal antibiotics to augment this. I think that um, I met um, a naturopath out of Australia. Her, her research was in Saccharomyces boulardii, which was one of the original probiotics. What's really cool about this, it's not a commensal organism, meaning we don't really have a whole lot of Saccharomyces in us. But what it does is it boosts your, your secretory IgA. So I'm having good success adding Atrantil plus Saccharomyces if we're going to stay all natural. There are other herbal antibiotics, which I'm having some fun with also. You know, I mean, the typical ones, Berberine, Allison. You know, I've got a lot of people that are really struggling, and so I can throw anything at them. And, but the most important thing is the motility agent. I, I think the thing I can help the most and get a sustained response is the motility agent. Because if you think of it this way, if you've got those antibodies that we were talking about, the vinculin antibodies, and they do not allow the small intestine to move, you can treat it with whatever you want. And then when they go to sleep at night, then the bacteria just start growing again. So I, I like to use a motility agent when they go to bed. And we used to have um, some other pharmaceutical agents which were used for constipation, which were serotonin agonists. Uh, but they got pulled off the market. That was Zelnorm. And Zelnorm was fantastic for that, really low dose. I will use sometimes erythromycin to, when they go to bed to help create that motility. If they want to stay all natural, then, you know, we go with the, the other motility agents like Iberogas and things like that. I've had less success with that, but if we're going to stay all natural, then I'll do that. By the way, that seems to be off the market right now for some reason. Oh, I didn't know that. Really? Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, some some pharmaceutical company bought the company, and nobody knows what's going on, but it's it's not really available. So I've been using Motil Pro, which has 5-HTP, which stimulates serotonin. Yeah. Cool. Also has ginger, but yeah. you know, get some results. Um, what but about, I would just, yeah, make sure that I, you really want that to kick in at night. That's, that's the most right. important. Thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, the migrating motor complex, right? That, that only comes in when you haven't eaten for like more than three or four hours. Exactly. Yeah. So we, that's known as the housekeeper phenomenon. Right. And when you go to sleep, you get into a deep sleep, which is a whole separate discussion, but sleep wow. is super important to treatment. And I think it's, it, you, you probably use probably talk sleep all the time for any other process, but I talk sleep a lot. We need to make sure that all these people get a good night's sleep because if you don't get into certain depths of sleep, you will not activate that migrating motor complex. 
So make sure you have good sleep hygiene, take it at night. And that housekeeper phenomenon does this very large contractions, which move everything from the small intestine into the colon. And that's it. That's a physiologic process. For whatever reason, people with SIBO can lose that. And when that happens, it's just a recurring, you're just on a hamster wheel. You can treat it during the day and it grows at night. Um, I, I've seen a lot of cases where uh, the patients who recur have several layers of dysfunction. So we'll do a stool test and we'll find out that in, in, in addition to SIBO, they have um, some uh, potentially pathogenic bacteria or they'll have... Uh, uh, they'll they'll have um, uh, a parasite or they'll have uh, fungal overgrowth, and so I I usually sequence it into several layers of treatment. You know, maybe one period of time where we're trying to work on the fungal overgrowth, and one period of time where we're focusing on the SIBO. And I wonder how often do you think that's the case, where you have layers of dysfunction? Well, I think that it probably happens all the time because. I inadvertently mentioned earlier the microbiome, which is yeah. the bacteria. But, you know, honestly, Ben, we should be talking about the multibiome. Yeah. It's not just bacteria. We've got an interaction with the bacteria right. and fungus and even viruses and even some parasitic organisms. Right. Uh, we don't think about that a whole lot. So when disruption happens. So one of the things that gets talked about a whole lot is the fungal overgrowth or the candida phenomenon. That was the before SIBO came on, I think everybody was using candida as the term. Right. What's fascinating to that is, uh, I've been doing a lot of thinking about this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to publish uh, something you can download from my website because there's some misinterpretation of it. And when I really started looking at the, at the multibiome, one of the problems I always had was that people, patients are coming in and they're like, I believe that I have candida overgrowth. And they would come in and I would explain to them, well, tell me what happens. They would eat and they would blow Okay, so it is possible, but it really sounds like more of a bacterial issue, bacterial overgrowth, and that's where the pendulum starts moving over here. So I started to really think about that more. Instead of just discounting it, I started looking into it more. And then I realized that when we have Canada albicans, which is the genus and species of the organism, when we had rampant AIDS before we had treatment and when we had chemotherapy, I would do endoscopies on people, and I would see their whole esophagus, stomach, and small bowel essentially coated white, white plaques everywhere. Wow. So it was such an overgrowth that it was becoming to the point where it could, once it crosses into the blood, then it's a systemic disease that will kill you very quickly. They never complained of these symptoms. They never had bloating. They never had this. They never had that. And so there wasn't a GI situation. It really got me thinking. I'm like, well, what is the role of this multibiome? Then I found some incredible literature where it shows that the fungus, when it breaks down starches, it is a fermentation organism. It'll produce CO2. So carbon dioxide is what we use when I do colonoscopies and endoscopies. We use CO2 because it doesn't stay in your intestines. It freely goes through the intestinal wall and you just breathe it out. So it can't create the bloating. And I'm like, man, this is crazy. But then I realized, oh, part of the multibiome the CO2 is the carbon backbone that the bacteria use to form the methane. So if an archaeobacter and a Canada species are side by side, the Canada will produce the, the carbon backbone and the archaea will produce the methane and allow both organisms to grow more. So that's where it was kind of the aha moment where I went, oh, it, we don't have to separate it. We have to treat the multibiome. So you've already figured out that there are layers to this. And yes, if you treat the bacteria and you still have this abundance of Canada, maybe they're not creating the symptoms, but they're creating the backbone for the bacteria to have a party and vice versa. They've shown that when you treat people with antibiotics, obviously you will have this rise in fungus. Just ask any woman that's ever had the whole yeast infection after they get antibiotics. It's exactly what's going on. We disrupt the checks and balances. Same thing can happen. We have shown that if you treat just the fungus, then you'll have a disruption, and sometimes you'll have a rise in a type of bacteria that you don't want. They keep each other in check. So that whole thing that you're talking about is brilliant, and I think that we're going to develop some protocols to treat these layers. Interesting. We, uh, we had a functional medicine meeting recently, and we had Dr. Rabar, um, who's in L.A., who has Integrative Gastroenterology Center, 
And um, he feels that a lot of cases of methane producing uh, bacterial overgrowth is actually related to Lyme disease that leads to immune dysfunction. Oh, wow. Interesting. And so a part of his protocol before he'll use a rifaximin or herbal antimicrobials, he'll use a few nutritional agents to try to strengthen their immune system first. So let's take, so I think that that is another great take. So admittedly, I am not a Lyme specialist. Right. And I always have this in the back of my mind because when I talk to my infectious disease guys in Dallas, Texas, where Lyme isn't supposed to exist, Lyme is the candida, the fibromyalgia, the, 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 the whatever. They, the chronic very, disease du jour. The chronic disease du jour. And so when I start asking about Lyme, um, but I, the reason why I started perking up with it is because I've had several patients that have traveled to the Northeast or I, they'll find somebody who's a true Lyme expert and they'll find a different way to diagnosis. So I'm, I always leave Lyme as a possibility. I just haven't figured out quite, you know, there's only so many hours in the day. I'll let, I'll let those experts figure that out and then right. teach me. Um, but think about this. So my research is headed this way. We now know that there is this overlap between IBS, food, and leaky gut. So when I talk leaky gut to my partners, and if a patient goes in and says that, they, they get laughed at. Yeah. And the doctors stick their head in the sand. So when I bring up leaky gut to my patients, they're always like, because they've already found it on the internet. I mean, everybody has information. They can listen to your podcast. They can hear your guests. They can do all that. So what we, what I like to address is the fact that leaky gut is intestinal permeability, which is a more scientific way to say leaky gut. Yeah. We know that bacterial overgrowth, infections, a protein called zonulin, and diet, and this gets back to the GMO, glyphosates, things like that, they can actually affect the intestinal membrane. So normally you should have this very tight junction and one of those things happens and it opens it up and allows some movement of antigens. And so the way this works on the immune level, and the reason why I'm referring to this is because I think this is exactly what um, that the doctor you're referencing was talking about the immune system. When you have a situation that is bothering the body, the dendrite, which is like a security guard, will reach up, sample this, hand it to a B cell and go, what do I do with this? And the B cell will look at it and be like, oh, that's a normal bacteria, you know, just ignore it. Or the B cell will go, whoa, this is Shigella and mobilize, sound the alarms, hands it to a T cell, T cell turns around, builds up all these antibodies, the antibodies go out and they get rid of the infection, which is what keeps us alive. The problem is, is that sometimes those antibodies will misinterpret our own body as something and then that's the autoimmune process. Well, what can happen with bacterial overgrowth is that the dendrite keeps handing it to the B cell and the B cell's like, I told you it's normal, ignore it. And the B cell's like, maybe it's not normal because it's been around here so long and now I'm getting really angry. Then it starts mobilizing these, uh, the same process to fight the infection and that creates more intestinal permeability. And then all of a sudden you start having the patients show up with the extra intestinal issues. I've got brain fog. I've got fibromyalgia, I've got fatigue. I don't feel right, something's wrong. And if you let that process continue, then that becomes an autoimmune situation. All these people, they'll, I'll see people with autoimmune disease, thyroid, um, autoimmune liver, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis. And they'll say, yeah, you know, it kind of all started about seven years ago. I really just kind of got sick and then my belly started acting up and then these other things started showing up. That's the explanation for celiac disease also and so on. So when it comes down to the immune system, anything that's revving it up, which is what I think your doctor was referring to, if you've got Lyme disease, which is an intracellular organism that it does a great job of avoiding the immune system, but periodically could turn it on, then you have these little hypersensitive immune situations. And that's my theory as to probably why he's getting at with the Lyme disease. I'm going to eventually learn a lot more about that. Um, but I think it's all interplayed. I think it's part of the multibiome. Well, this may also be why there's a connection between SIBO and ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, which are the 
um, autoimmune um, intestinal issues, um, the inflammatory bowel disease, and why patients who have SIBO have an increased risk of getting one of those. And um, I've seen patients with, say, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, and, and then we uh, treat them for SIBO, and their, um, their Crohn's will get better. And I think it's because it's probably decreasing that leaky gut and decreasing the additional um, stress on, on that auto, autoimmune component. 100%. Now, almost all my patients with inflammatory bowel disease are on this. This is, I got some, uh, I just got contacted last week. There's a conference in Austin, if any of your listeners are around there, called Paleo FX. Okay. And um, they're going to ask me to give a lecture on this exact topic with sort of this, this interaction between all these things, trying to make when, sense of it. When is that going to be? When is that? April, it's late April, late April this year, April 25th. 30th, somewhere around there. Something. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So Paleo FX 2018. There's some, um, I'm on a little side stage. There's some really cool speakers this year. JJ Virgin speaking, Joseph Mercola speaking, Ben Greenfield, Rob Wolf. So I'm just honored that they uh, kind of threw me in there also. I don't think I'm on the main stage, but uh, <laughs> I, would have, I would love to have people learning about this because I'm passionate about it. And yeah. it's an opportunity to just sort of integrate all that. So Yeah, that's great. So this has been a great podcast, Dr. Brown. Um, I don't have any further questions or any, any other pressing uh, thoughts that you had to that you want to get out there. Well, you know what? I mean, my deal is uh, just keep an open mind. We um, we're still learning. I think that uh, I'm my new research right now is getting into this whole aspect of leaky gut and brain inflammation. Yeah. So there's a um, we do have a, a Facebook group where I'd love to hear people's opinions on this it's a closed group really want very serious people okay that brain connection and i'm i believe and it's not just me i've heard is, is that what's called gut brain connection in facebook yeah, the gut brain connection community yeah okay and, um, we I, I i love it because i did uh you know i'm having some other functional medicine guys come on that can offer things you should join also to give your yeah. to go ahead and give your insight um, and we're going to go ahead and, uh, eventually we'll get our podcast up and running and do a few things like that. We'll have you on. I learned so much doing this. Like now I'm going to go back and you know, the layers you're talking about is fantastic. I love the, I love the good that you're doing for your community. And I think that we just make each other better kind of iron sharpens iron. Cool. Cool. Um, and, and we also have a closed Facebook page. It's called the functional medicine discussion group of Santa Monica. If you'd like to. Oh, really? add your input yeah yeah we have a monthly discussion group we have uh um we have dr vashtani speaking in a few weeks so really looking forward to that on autoimmune oh that's uh, awesome so for practitioners and listeners who want to get a hold of you what's the best way for them to contact you easiest way is to go to kbmd uh health.com just okay. kb Kenneth Brown, MD, health.com or just kenneth brown md.com we got both and we'll be able to connect and you know, do the usual stuff. I, uh, I learned so much by having questions from people, you know, because it makes and, you go look it up. And where, where, where can they go to get a hold of Ontron Till? Where can uh, they be purchased? Yeah, just go to lovemytummy.com. Okay. Lovemytummy.com and or go to atrontil.com. It's A-T-R-A-N-T-I-L.com. But love my tummy. come up with that name? It sounds like some French cosmetic or something. <laughs> This is uh, here. We're here in the studio. That's what it looks like right there. So, you know, we develop, I mean, we basically developed this. It's the first thing. And so um, when you go to trademark a name, you will find that pharmaceutical companies have whole divisions where they will trademark thousands of names. And if you are phonetically or visually even close to them, then they will become trademark bullies and sue you. Wow. So you have to just do this word lab. So I was at my endoscopy center. We got about 30 employees and I just put blank pieces of paper up and I was like, come up with the name of my product. And nurses would walk by and just write stuff. And eventually it came down to Trontil, just T-R-A-N-T-I-L. I was like, that makes me think that that's tranquil. I like that. And we went to file that. Our attorneys said, listen, it, it's too close to something. If you throw an A in front, <laughs> We're like, all right, you know, we're this far into it. Let's do it. So it became, so now the A became our symbol here. So 
it's a uh, yeah it's kind of a funny deal so you know it, it's life lessons you know i've been doing i've never done a startup before so we're two years into it it's growing rapidly i'm having fun uh, but it's just jumping one hurdle after another that's why when you say ibero gas there's probably the ceo of that company is probably uh wrestling with the idea that a pharmaceutical company is hiding his product they're going to try and do stuff they're probably behind closed doors and he's probably thinking it was a whole lot more fun where he was just producing it and helping people but i'm yeah, sure it's life. okay this is great ken talk to you soon all right buddy thanks okay